Hello, and welcome back to Zim Explorer. I am Dr. Abstract. And in this Zim Explorer, we're going to take a look at the second half of the multi user app called Grava. Grava. Nice, huh? And so, what Grava does is it uh, you have to clear a path. So, you're a grab bot. And you've got to clear a path somewhere here. So we're going a path. What path? How do I? Oh, how do I know what the? Hey, wait a minute. If I clear this column, then it uh, shows me that you know it's it's clearing a path. Um, so great. There's a path that is cleared, uh, but there's more than one page. So over in this page, I've got to clear a path. Oh, oh yeah. Okay, here's where I clear the path. But watch as I clear the path here. I'm pushing all these guys over back in this page. Hey, my path isn't cleared anymore. <laughs> so it's this, uh, it's multi-user. So there are multiple people in here all trying to clear all these paths on these uh, so-called pages or whatever in Grava, wherever Grava is. And this all relates to uh, sci-fi that started, well, these patterns came from a 70s wallpaper. And we used to have parties and stuff like that uh, using this wallpaper. Not in the 70s, but <laughs> later on. We put it on tables for medieval pieces. It looks like metal almost. It was really cool. And I was using it for sci-fi tapes uh, as the, the cassette covers. And, and then came Save Earth in 2000, one of the first, one of the first um, CSS pages, 2000. So CSS is now 20 years old. My goodness. And a whole bunch of uh, the meta mystery came. So Save Earth was a, a nano sort of tech issue stuff. And all of this is nanotech uh, and part of the meta mysteries, part of Nanora. Nanora is like life at really small levels. It done sci-fi um, videos or film festivals with that. Uh, and more games. Um, there was the Meta Monks and stuff. There was an early Zim game, as a matter of fact, or HTML5 Canvas game. And then we're reusing these patterns, and Grava is all part of that as well. So as we launch this, we'll give you links back to the past. Uh, Nanora is on Altura, which is a, an early mobile app to let people tell stories with alternate, alternate uh paths and stuff like that, like choose your own adventure type things <laughs> in a slightly special way. <laughs> you get to choose the adventure, but uh, the adventure you choose doesn't necessarily happen. Um, anyway, so we're continuing on in there. Now, this is the second half, as, as mentioned. That means, uh, I've maybe already told you some of this, I'm not sure, but you should go look at the first half if you're just arriving. So if, if you haven't seen the first half, which rambled a bit, I must admit, and we almost redid it, but you never know when we ramble, you never know where there's things that will help you guys out. So I may as well leave it in there. Hopefully you don't mind. It's almost like a half storytelling, half half code looking through. And so speaking of code though, why don't we actually dip into some code then? We'll reduce this down. Now this is multi-user, so uh, you might want to see just a bit of that if we were to open up another one here and pop it on over here. So now we go into Grava and as I move uh, here, oh, this is a, we're on a different page here, I think. Yeah. So let me go back to the beginning. So here's the beginning. And as I move here, it moves there and, and vice versa. So see that? Cool, huh? So that's a multi-user. Um, okay, into some code then. So we've looked through the code already. We're bringing in Zim Socket and stuff like that. Uh, just as a quick quick review here, we're using Model View Controller. So we make the model. We wait until the socket's ready. Then we pass the model into the view. The view is the things that we see. The model is our data. Uh, and we also run a controller, and we pass the model and the view to the controller. So in the last a Zim Explorer, we took a look at this. We took a look at creating the model. So here's the model. We've already seen uh, creating the socket, waiting for the socket to be ready, getting the data, that kind of stuff, various uh, methods that the socket will do to help us uh, keep track of that data. Over in the view, we looked at making a pattern. Every time uh, that makes a pattern, but we're passing that into the tile here. 
So I can make this a bit bigger for you. So when we pat, when we create the tile, these are the circle tiles, like the tiling of all of the little circles. Each for each tile that we make, we uh, sorry, tile is a confusing word, isn't it? Plural tiles, we'll call it tiles. For each tile we make in the tiles, we're calling make pattern. Make pattern returns either a space, like an empty container, if there's a space in the data, this is us getting the data, or it returns um, based on the pattern itself. Uh, we've got this array right here of patterns, zero to nine. This array is made up of these containers. This is the actual view. So we're in the view. These are the circles. This is what makes up those circles. We store each one in the array. We then get the correct one based on the data. We clone it, which I don't think we need, but maybe we do. And we rotate it to be whatever the rotation in the data says. So all that, all the rotations and the patterns will match across. Not that it matters so much, actually. Those patterns are really don't have anything to do with the puzzle, so to speak. Uh, but it helps that they visually match. It's yeah, like, kind of nice. All right, so that's all what we talked about before. We maybe didn't look into an intro, so why don't we see how we did the intro? The intro is all on a pane, as in this kind of pane right here. We might need the intro later. As a matter of fact, we'll need to know when the intro is closed. And that's in the controller. The controller here probably has an event somewhere on that intro. Shall we look for it? Control F, uh, intro. And here it is, v.intro.onClose. So the controller is controlling things. Hey, when we close this, Here's what we want to do. We want to set the page number to zero. This is like when we first started, uh, well, as in when we read the instructions, <laughs> brief instructions, close the pane. We then make a tile. We're going to make the nav come up on the tile, and we're going to do this stuff, whatever that stuff is doing. Okay. Applying some events to our menu. Now, note how we've got this uh, v.intro. We can access things from the view. So here's the view. In the view, we're making var intro. be const intro, I think, most likely. Don't think we ever put a different pane in there. Um, anyway, uh, there it is. So for local stuff, we can use that. So when we center reg some stuff on the intro, we can just use that reference. But if we want something in the controller to access the pane, then we're storing the intro on the view. So in, this intro is a property of the view. The V is, is this. So it, we're in a class right now. We're in the class called app.view, view with a capital letter. This is ES6 class, or sorry, ES5 class, so not an ES6 class. Um, we've uh, this is the object that gets made the view object and we're storing that in the const called v so in here everything we put on v is is a property or a method so if it's a function we're storing on that then it's a method uh if it's where we get to uh, label 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 sorry scan 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 beads 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 intro yes so uh, this intro is a property of our view. And it's this new pane here with the background color. We made it extra big so it goes off the edge of the stage. Therefore, it just looks like a big page rather than a, like a panel, so to speak. Um, we've got a back that is cloned. Oh, yeah, OK. So uh, let's check out that intro again then. We refresh here. Bloop. Here's the intro. This whole big circle with the dark top and the light bottom, that is one of the, uh, that's two, that's one of our, our circles. And we're cloning that, and we're rotating it, because I guess it, you know, we wanted it so the dark thing was on the top rather than on the left or whatever. And we're scaling it really big, centering it on our intro, moving it a touch, uh, setting it to alpha zero, and then animating it up in three seconds. So it's like, oh, here we are. And it just animates up to a, an alpha of 0.2. Okay. Now, 
uh, we did that so that it doesn't just look like a big rectangle page. Instead, it's got part of what we're using on it. And that's a good idea to do. If you've got a pane, like even if it's a help pane or menu, you know, or not menu, uh, what they call it, like an alert box or something like that, it's, it's a good idea if you're using a pane to put something there, put an icon that, that is one of your icons or, or a little logo. Or when we did tea bugs, for instance, we uh, put a little picture of the tea bug. We used the assets that we were using in, in our game right on that menu and it sort of cuts it, it personalizes it a bit it makes it yours it's more professional so uh, we also brought in our patterns we've got these nice patterns let's use them and once we had this big circle on there it was like oh wait a minute you know maybe we could make all the patterns go around like that that would look really cool that would be hard to do it would be a pain in the neck it would it would take time but Zim has provided us with beads. Uh, this is brand new beads, and hey, we're using it already. So we specify a path of a blob. Uh, it's either got to be a blob or a squiggle for these beads to go on. And we say to that blob, please be round. So the points uh, in the sh shape of a circle. You could also put in some SVG there, or you could uh, make a path and then record it and stuff. Uh, that's all Zim Neo stuff. So have a Look at zimjs.com slash neo, N-I-O, for 9. That was all new in Zim 9. We're giving it a radius. The object that we're going to make beads of, uh, if we just said new circle here, a new circle, and uh, I don't know, 20 or something, and made it, well, not blue, anything but blue, purple. Purples. <laughs> uh, then we would be passing in a bunch of, uh, a bunch of, circles. There's a bunch of purple circles. Okay, that's not what we want though. So what we're passing in there instead as the object to to make beads from is patterns. Patterns is this array right up here somewhere. Right here's here's patterns. That's all our individual 0, 1, 2, 3. Those are all our individual circle patterns that we've made. Those are containers that hold a bunch of circles. So if we pass that array into beads, then beads will automatically, it's a Zim V value. A Zim V value, you can pass in an array and it will randomly pick from that array. If we wanted a series of them, then we would pass in a series. And a series would do all of those things in the array in order. But if we just pass the array, then it, it randomly picks from them, which is fine. All right, great. Uh, now, we're sort of off off track with respect to the sockets but like I said all, all of this stuff you never know what we're going to see here all this stuff can be handy we didn't really want to do this explore we're exploring we didn't really want to do this explore only on sockets and exploration allows us to wander and see what's here uh, this is a pretty specific wandering because we're just wandering through an app that is already made <laughs> so uh, so be it here we go then Continuing on. We're animating that. We're rotating it. Make sure that it's linear. Look at how long we have to animate that. 200 seconds. I don't know how long that is. Otherwise, it looks like it's going too fast. So sometimes we have to animate over a long period. And then this is fading the anime, or fading the, the alpha up uh, as, we, as we enter there. Note that you can do that. You want two different animations. You can animate like that. Now, why do we move to label letters here to put in Grava? I guess the reason would be because this is what it looked like if we didn't do what we're what we're doing here. New label, no comma there. So let's just see what the new label of Grava looks like uh, with the Megatron font as we put it into place here. So we refresh here. Should have our circles back, and we do. This is what Grava looks like with the automatic kerning that comes with the font. It's like, really? Jeez, that's, uh, that's pretty tight in there. It makes this thing all look like a unit, and then these two, like, great Ava! <laughs> GR Ava! Um, but anyway, I didn't like it like that, so we took matters into our own hands. Now, the canvas doesn't have any way to kern here, aside from, I mean, we could make... Uh, we use, use Photoshop or something and make an image of, of this, um, which you can certainly do. You can 
this could have been a Photoshop image, no problem. But uh, we've got our own font here, Megatron. And so what we've done is we've thrown it into label letters. Label letters just puts the labels, or the, it breaks that into individual labels. So a G label, an R label, an A. And it will put those next to one another. But we can also pass in spacings here to say how much to move. If we don't pass in the spacings, here's what it just looks like. Uh, probably not very good. Now, the funny thing is, if it's normal font, the, the default font, actually it looks exactly like the font uh, if you just made a single label. So, in other words, you use a default label with um, default label, or de default font with a label, and then you use that same default font with the label letters, you actually can't tell the difference. But with this one, it appears you can. It must, uh, there, I think there seems to be some room around these guys that like that doesn't look good at all. So we had to bring that in minus 35 and minus 35 and uh, it's like adjusting the, the kerning. So 5, we added 5 between the G and the R, subtracted 10 between the R and the A, subtracted 35 between the A and the V, and between the V and the A. So we save this up and here we are kerning on the canvas. No, comma comma back. Was there anything else we needed to put back? This doesn't quite look full yet. Uh, I guess that's good. Okay, just didn't undo through that. And refresh. So here we are. We wanted these to touch and we've got some nice negative space uh, look in there. That all looks good. So certainly pay attention to that. You should be using at least a custom font for your logo. If not even if, if you're really professional, you might be making that font yourself. Uh, you might manipulate the font in some way. Use a couple different fonts in a logo. Sometimes that, that happens. If you don't like this A, say you really like this. Oh, yeah, but these A's are ridiculous. Well, then cut that off and put it up here, you know, into a traditional A or try and find a better A. Uh, pay some pay attention with the name of your your app. All right, or get a designer to do it. <laughs> that also works. All right, so good. Uh, label letters, super. Um, what else are we doing here? Now the subhead there, the subheading. How much time we need? This needs to be two sets of of uh, labels. So this is a font right here. And here's another font setting, so it's smaller, it's a different color. We cannot, in one label, handle multicolor or multi-font or multi-size, that kind of thing. So we just break that into two. It only takes a second to do. Instructs with a bunch of spaces. And then um, we inserted that, and then we have the graph bot in there. Like I said, it just takes a moment, moment to do that. All right, navigation. The navigation is a radial menu that we're bringing up there. Uh, what are these things? Line H, line B, fronting. Not sure what all that stuff is. Line H and line B. It's blue. Oh, okay. That's going to be maybe the line 150. Are we using? I don't even think we're using this anymore. Well, it must be. What would a blue line do? Um, I don't know. <laughs> well, let's do a search on it. You guys, there's only one thing here. Any line? Oh, yeah, there's some line H's and line B's. Go to a page. Oh, right, 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 right. So this is handling, uh, it says right here, assets for page animation. So as we go from one page to another, Let's have a look. Uh, we're, we're inside here. As we go from one page to another, a blue line sweeps by. All right, that indicates that we're moving. And if we go down, it's, it sweeps up. We could have cached this whole thing and animated it up as we cached the next page and animated that up. Would have been no problem. The thing is, we're operating a puzzle here. This is actually a puzzle. And if we do that, it maybe makes it a bit easier to solve the puzzle. <laughs> hint, hint. So we didn't want that. We wanted it to just go from one page to the other without actually 
showing the movement between pages. So uh, we had to show some movement though. So that's why we uh, chose to move it that way. If you don't mind, I'm just going to let the cat in. Hang on a sec. All right, my apologies. Hopefully that's allowed you to examine some of these patterns. Admire it. It's a nice pattern, isn't it? So that's what those blue lines are, are created for. This is the view. So anything that we see, we uh, prepare for that. Fronting, I'm not too sure it's black. Oh yeah, that would be the thing that showed up as we went from page to page. We, instead of a backing, we called it a fronting. What do you think? So as we go from page to page, that was that black shape that we just saw there. All right, we're going to make the nav. Now this is the function to make the nav. It would be nice to make the nav now, but um, we're putting the nav on the second stage. Uh, I don't know, I don't think we've mentioned it in our summary here. All of these shapes in behind, those are vectors. That's a thousand vectors. If we were to drag this nav around on it, if it were on the same stage, we would have to update the stage with all of these vectors on it. And that that would uh, bog mobile a little bit. Like it, it, would, it would look like this eh, 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 kind of thing. So uh, this is much more smooth because we put this on a different stage, on a stage on top. So you make a, a new Zim frame. So we've got a Zim frame made for the back. We've got a Zim frame made for the top. The nav is in the top. The top has the font that we're loading. And therefore, the bottom will be made first. And we can't just, uh, so it's a matter of what loads when kind of thing. So what we've, how we've handled that is we've made the menu, but we've stored it all in uh, this function right here called make nav. All right, and when we're all ready to go, we'll make the nav. As a matter of fact, uh, this is called when the second frame is ready. That's not quite true. It's now called when it used to be that way, but then we added the whole intro page. So the intro page, when the intro page is cleared, that's when this gets called. So it's, it gets called when intro is cleared or closed, I guess is the word for it. All right, we can find that out by just doing a quick search on the controller. Let's see, make nav. And here it is. So when the intro closes, and isn't that nice? There's the v dot intro. So the, the whole intro is stored on the view, and that's why we can access it from here, from the controller, because the view right here is being collected from the controller. <laughs> Right back in here, when we make the controller, we pass in the model and the view. Right, we made the view. Uh, when we made the view, we put that, we put the menu on the view. So, or no, well, what was it that we put on the view? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> something, we put something on the view. Uh, the make nav function is stored on the view. So, here's the make nav function. Right, okay, great. All right, the menu itself is a radial menu. Nice, huh? So we get to use a radial menu. That's fairly new in Zim as well. It's a round menu. Normally, the radio men radial menu has more to it than, than just this. Uh, normally, it expands open, and it can handle any number of radial uh, sort of menus, uh, rings or whatever. Uh, but that's fine. It also handles this. Now, it's a little bit different. Usually, a menu we are choosing uh, something and it stays chosen. Here we decided that it, it's it's more like, hey, I just clicked that. Uh, we did have to hide these things, so that was a little custom custom work to hide hide that. Could have used a D-pad maybe, but the D-pad is more like you click and hold it and then it moves something. So the D-pad's also circular with arrows already, and it's kind of like, hey, that looks like a D-pad, but it's a little different. Uh, Okay, so anyway, we did do a radial menu. We passed in the font. We have Carava there. We had to readjust that, I think, to do the kerning even on that menu as well. So you'll see that a bit later if we bother looking at it again. We've got the rotate icons true, and we're passing in a, a nothing for these. So there's no text. Instead, we're passing in 
uh, in the styles, the icons are these triangles. So there's a bunch of triangles. And it, like I said, we've got the rotate icons true. We set some spacing and gap arrangements uh, custom uh, there. Backdrop colors, we added a gradient, anything else of interest here, current selected. We worked through some current selected, like I said, so it doesn't actually select the thing, or no, it allows you to select it even if it's selected, that's the issue. Normally with a menu, like a tab, you select it. After you select it, it doesn't really let you select it again, unless you say current selected, oh, false, uh, current enabled true. Um, anyway, whatever, uh, you, you guys you can read through the parameters on that current enabled, uh, that's it. So not current selected. Current selected is whether it shows that it's selected and we don't want to show that it's been selected. Current enabled, we want to be true so that we can click it more than once. Even we can click something even if it's the currently selected one. Because if we hit the arrow to the right, great, it's selected. Normally we couldn't select it again because it's selected. So we've turned current enabled true. That means it, it, it acts as, uh, you know, <laughs> we can keep on clicking it. <laughs> All right, label letters, that's us uh, fixing the kerning. So we just basically removed the title from it and we added, uh, we located it at the menu title. Isn't that neat? So we left the menu title in there so that we could locate our new thing at wherever that menu title is, which is probably just centered in there anyway, no big deal and we put it in the menu titles parent. So this was sort of like a customization. Unfortunately, we had to customize in there. And uh, we also have to, have to customize the core. The core collapses all the menus. So uh, radial menu was complicated. We didn't make it all that, uh, like it is quite flexible, but some things weren't flexible. Uh, you can open the things up and you can close them. Well, we didn't make it so that you can't close them. <laughs> You know, that kind of thing. So we actually remove the event listeners from the core. So we give access to the core, remove the event listeners, and actually did a custom drag on it as well, which uh, lets you pick this thing up. So normally, if I click that, it would actually close this ring. <laughs> and if I click it again, it would open the ring. Well, we didn't want that, so we took the events off, and then we made the whole thing drag, so you can even drag here. Oops, I clicked and dragged at the same time. Oh, I guess that does, that's what that does, click and drag. So anyway, be careful. You can drag from the center of it and it drags the whole menu. Took a little bit of uh, custom work there. Which means we may look at it and this is how we operate in Zim. It's sort of like, oh wait, you know, we just build an app and we, we needed to be able to drag this thing easily. What, we didn't make the radial menu draggable? So now we're gonna probably look at it for a future uh, version and say, hey, we should supply a draggable parameter so that we can drag this radial menu. It would have been handy to have that rather than have to customize it. How's everybody doing on the Explore? Let's take a, a deep breath here or call it halfway through. <sighs> deep breath. All right, what else do we have then? Boop, boop, boop. Outer menu buttons, what? Buttons, buttons, buttons. Uh, right, okay, so menu.outer menu would give us access to the ring that holds those buttons. Buttons are all of the rings. And we're telling get child at three to be invisible. So hey, turn off the icon, okay? Get the third button, or the, actually that's a fourth button, I guess. Get the first button and set the icons invisible for those. So again, some customization. This is uh, this is the zero. Uh, one, two, three. So um, I'm not sure what do we do. Icons three. Do we rotate this thing? <laughs> Whatever. Maybe, maybe the thing on the right is the first one. Zero, one, two, three. Yeah, it must be. So this must be the first one. That's the second one. Third one. This is the zero. Well, I thought it started at zero there. Whatever. Uh, you get the idea, right? Hey, desktop reveal, doop, 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 doop. Half desktop reveal. Um, alrighty, what else? Cache. Oh, something about caching as we animate in. I think we animated in, no big deal. Don't worry about that. And then we make an emitter because we've got that tip that we're, that we're bringing in. So that looks like when we move something from the right column, or the right path, there it is. So that's the emitter, see that? 
whoop, whoop. It's like a ring that opens up. We tried a variety of different emitters. In the end, uh, we start pause true. We just made it a simple circle. Blue, no gravity, so it doesn't fall down. Uh, we probably don't even need an interval anymore because we're, we're only going to... Uh, actually, that's kind of interesting. I wonder if that's what's causing the delay. We, I did notice that as we uh, do that, watch. See how it kind of sits there for a bit and then shoots out? I was wondering why that happened, and maybe because our interval is too high. Uh, default is 50. What if we turn the interval off? Let's just have a look. Maybe it's waiting 2,000 or 200. Um, oh. Missed. Missed. There. Nah, it still looks like it gets placed. It must just, I don't know, it seems like it gets placed and then it, it shoots off. Uh, okay, whatever. That's the force that it's that will act upon it. Um, zero force. So why is it even going anywhere? I don't know. It emits. What is uh, a force is going to emit in some direction? So if we go minus uh, twenty, oh, that's a lot. That's going to go fast. We'll just go minus five. This is going to push the ring up. Whoa, desktop reveal. Why am I doing these desktop reveals? There we go. Let's switch that up. Uh, by the way, I should just tab between these things. One day I'll grow up and tab between these things. So here we go. <laughs> oh, it totally looks like there's a force, but we've got some, it's like changing directions. It's up and down. And did I ever rotate this thing? The emitter must be rotated for some reason. Because that force should always just go up. We're locating it on the menu. The menu, does the menu ever rotate? That's a weird, it's weird happening there. Anyway, not sure what that is, but uh, there's bound to be a reason somewhere on it. Uh, maybe the circle doesn't rotate. No. Okay, don't know. Uh, the conclusion pane. So we get a pane that, oh, you don't want to see that. That would like be sneaking. That's like, that's where the answer and stuff shows up. Uh, but anyway, that allows you to try and solve the, the puzzle when something finishes. So we won't bother looking at that. Let's jump on over to the controller. All right, maybe we'll have some explanation as to what's going on with that ring as it shoots out there. Uh, but uh, there we go. Here is the controller. So we're bringing in the model in the view or collecting it. We're in the controller. We might need the calls, the rows, the spacing. So we're just taking some nice local variables to operate on those. Sometimes what happens is you, you build your app as a single page app, a spa. And then partway through you say, oh boy, this is getting big. We better split this up. Um, I think that's what happened in this case. I, I was building it as a single page app and I went, ah, you know what, I wouldn't mind teaching the model view controller. This is getting big enough. We've got some good models. we got some good view. we got some good controller. Let's split it up. Well, that means all the code already is using calls and rows. So it'd be a bit of a pain to go into that code and change it all to m.calls and m.rows. So instead, we just bring in the model and then we set calls locally here equal to m.calls, and hey, you don't have to change any code after that. So that's what we've done. It also just makes it a bit easier to read down below if we just use calls rather than m.calls. All right, so we're swiping. We're swiping, we're making a swipe class, uh, or object, sorry, a swipe object from the swipe class, and we're passing in the backing the V backing. So the backing was put there. It's the same color as the stage was put there specifically so we could pass that into swipe. Truthfully, I can't remember. We might might be able to pass in the stage to, sw to swipe and then just swipe on the stage. I can't remember, like I said. Swipe is built like that because quite often we don't want to swipe everywhere. This is a case where actually we want to capture a swipe anywhere, but quite often you would just want to capture a swipe on a certain object. So you pass in that object that you want to capture the swipe on. And then when you swipe on the object, it will give you a swipe event saying up, down, left, right, that kind of thing. So they're setting some variables for that. Um, also, we may not always be able to move. If somebody else is moving, then we're using the socket to tell us that. And they won't let us move. 
<laughs> yeah, we were doing some debugging on that. Uh, just trying that with um, another person. And we were still getting some issues there. So we're going to look into that. But anyway, that's the concept. Um, right. Uh, this was a bit complicated going back into the sockets where if somebody left as they were swiping, the swiping locks it. It, it creates a ready check uh, or something like that. Uh, uh, let's see if we can see it here. Swipe busy time. Busy. It's busy something. Not busy time. Busy check. Okay. So um, there's two checks here. One is an allow check. This is for us ourselves. When we swipe a pattern. We don't want to be able to swipe another pattern right away. Uh, so until it's finished animating, we're going to set an allow check to false. So initially we get our own allow check to true and we can't double swipe. All right. That's one thing. But when we swipe, we also set a busy check somewhere in here. So that would be swipe. Uh, here's the swipe right here. Is it? Yeah, swipe that on swipe. Socket request time. And where are we setting our busy check? Socket.set properties busy check true. So within our swipe, we're going to set the busy check to true. So we're setting a bunch of properties all at the same time. Setting the busy check to true. We're also push data. We're also passing, oh, the specific um, thing that we pushed on. Okay, what what page number are we on? So what page, what column did we push on? What row did we push on? Which direction did we push on? Or in the X, anything? One for positive, minus one for negative, zero if we didn't, same with the Y. And the index uh, that we swiped on, how do we know that? Swipe index, oh yeah, okay, that's just sort of splitting it up. Based on this swipe index that we get, we calculated the column and the row, but uh, we'll come back to that. Uh, so we pass that data to everybody else, and everybody else reads that data and says, oh, I got to swipe that way. That's better than passing all of the data. Now, according to our testing, though, maybe something was going wrong in here, and maybe it would be safer to just pass all our data and remake it when somebody receives this data. I don't know. We're, we're going to check. But anyway, we also set a busy time. So last check, what time was it when we set this? The reason for that is if the user exits as, as this check is set, like they've just said, hey, we're busy. We're busy. And if they exit, um, it never, nothing sets it back to not being busy. <laughs> and we don't want the socket left with this. Sorry, everybody, it's still busy. Hey, maybe the guy left. But we're still busy. So um, we're passing the time that this happened. And we get that busy time. Or sorry, it's last check from up here, I think. Let busy time equal socket busy time. Now that, so OK, as we come in, this is where sockets is confusing, no doubt. And I'm sorry if we're jumping around here, but hopefully you're a little bit with me. Like a story. Remember, this is kind of like a story. You get stuff out of it, little tips. You don't have to like study it or anything like that. You just sort of say, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. All right, so I'm telling a story of how this all works here. So um, as we swipe, we don't even want to go in and set busy. We don't want to do all this stuff if it's already busy, right? So this is a swiping on a thing. We don't know yet if somebody else is, is, is if it's still busy. So what we need to do when we swipe, when we want to swipe, we have to ask, is this busy? So let busy time equal this last uh, socket or the last value of busy time. This will tell us what time somebody else swiped this. And then we say, well, as long as we aren't still swiping <laughs> or, you know, that it's not animating from us swiping, and as long as uh, the socket's latest value of busy check, so it's not uh, busy check says it's it's um, okay, but and the busy time or if there's a busy time and it's within the last two seconds, so 
what this is saying basically is um, <sighs> what this is saying is is it within two seconds from whenever somebody said they last swiped? All right, it's got it's got to be at least within two seconds, um, or busy check could be false. So if it's not if it's not busy, great, then go ahead and swipe. But if busy if it is busy, that busy has to be only two seconds old. Okay, if it's older than that, ignore it because uh, what you know it, it's something's gone wrong. I wonder that it's possible that there's a bug in here. You know, we had we had a problem where as I swiped, I saw somebody else's swipe go. So something bad happened on occasion, not a lot, but every once in a while, I would see their animations kind of go on top of my animation. So it was like two sets of things. And I'm, oh, boo, geez, I, I, that's not supposed to happen. So something is buggy. Obviously, you can see that this is a, you know, a complex uh, situation here. And that happens with multi-user. Uh, you can almost guess, aside from doing the very basics and following something like, uh, like a basic chat, possibly a basic avatar move, even then there's always these, these sort of twisty things that happen. And I would say that this example is not really basic. We've got multiple pages. We're animating different people on multiple pages. We're trying to lock it so they can't animate. We realized as well that we don't want animation to happen as we change pages. <laughs> so what was happening is it changed the page and halfway through the page, all of a sudden this animation would appear. And that's another thing. The animation is on the frame above. So our data and stuff is on the frame below. The animation is uh, being overlaid in a sense to, um, to help us out with performance. So uh, that's why we're seeing things like animations happening over top of page changes. So we just need to lock the, we, we can't animate when there's a page change, uh, so no problem. It's just, you know, a bit of debugging that, that happens all the time, and, and it does happen quite a, often with multi-user. All right, so how's this story going? Are you getting anything from it? Or if you're probably getting, oh boy, this is too complicated to even try from it. But hey, <laughs> sorry if that's the case. Uh, you know, you're welcome to come in and find this code and, and deal with it, uh, you know, bit by bit if, if you need to. Uh, you know, it, it's all kind of custom. You're probably not going to have a situation that's exactly like this. But I think seeing how, how things like this can be done will probably help you in the future to do things like this. All right. So if, however, it is busy, then we're setting the menu's core color to red. So you'll see that uh, pop up there. Even if I swipe myself, and the allow check isn't true, if I swipe myself, I can make it go red. Should I try? Uh, it's hard. You have to kind of catch your own swipe. <laughs> We've still got that ring going the wrong way. There, I did it. Um, so it, it's the, the time is actually 200 milliseconds. So what I'm trying to do there is swipe something else within 200 milliseconds, which is actually pretty hard to do. But you saw an example of the core there. That's the core of the menu going red. That's just a busy indicator, basically. What we're, and, and we have to update the stage of the navigation. So it's not a stage.update like that <laughs> or something like that. Ay, ay, ay. Not a stage dot update. It's the stage nav dot update. If you look on the first page here, we've declared up top here frame nav and stage nav. We make the first normal stage, and then after when that normal stage is ready, we then create the frame nav, which brings in the Megatron and gets us ready to put our navigation on it. And then when the frame nav is ready, we call stage nav the frame nav stage. That allows us to access each different stage. So we don't update the main stage, which has all those patterns on it. We update the stage nav, which only has the navigation on it. And sometimes we pop up over top of that all the little circles that we're animating. Uh, which we'll probably get to at some point, huh? <laughs> what would have thought? <laughs> part three, anybody? <laughs> no, okay. I pr promise you, no part three. Uh, and I also... 
want to end this up within an hour. All right, so we come on down here. Find out the row and column the swipe is on. Oh, yeah, this is kind of cool. So no point in finding out the row and column of the swipe if we can't swipe. Basically, this is saying you can't swipe. There's the return. Go back. You, you try to swipe, but we're not ready to swipe because of some reason. That's what that's all saying. So assuming that we can, not yet. <laughs> not quite yet. Once we get through this check, great, that we're allowed to swipe, we find out uh, the swipe index. Now, the swipe index is determined up here on the stage mouse down. So when we mouse down on the stage, which is kind of funny, because, uh, you know, what happened to our backing? Oh, you know, we might not be able to mouse down on the backing because there could be something in the way. But a stage mouse down captures a mouse down anywhere on the stage, including on top of navigation or on top of circles or on top of whatever. Uh, or if there's nothing there, it still counts it. So this is a guaranteed, I know that there's a cursor down. Uh, at that point, if if it's not allowed, check, then we return. If, if we're not allowed to swipe, then it just leaves anyway. Otherwise, it goes with a hit test grid. This is the fastest way to calculate where your cursor is on a grid of things. And we definitely have a grid of these circles. So we're using that hit test grid on the backing. So where did we hit on the backing? We're giving the stage width and the stage height is the size of it, the number of calls, the number of rows, and then the frame.mousex and the frame.mouseY. This is where the point that we're testing is. Note that we're using the mouse X and mouse Y on the frame. That's been adjusted to Zim Retina. All right. Zim Retina, you can't just use stage X and stage Y or the event object stage X, stage Y. You can't even use, uh, what was the other one? Um, all right. Anyway, you, you can't use those because they're CreateJS based. They weren't adjusted for scaling the stage. Uh, CreateJS needs to fix that. So we've gone into frame.mousex, frame.mouseY. We've scale. We've we've adjusted that to this stage scale because uh, in in Retina the the stage or the, the the frame or the stage canvas or whatever gets scaled to match the pixel density. All right, and that messes up everything. Uh, we have to fix it. So there we are getting the X and Y position, and we also are saying where does it start? So that starts based on where the tile is, and these are the spacings in the X and Y. So that's a big long parameter set uh, that you pass in to find out where in the grid you're hitting, but that's a calculation. All this stuff is just a calculation in there. It is not, is the cursor on a pixel color? because that's a hit test on a color, and that's slower. All right, so if you're doing anything like pixel drawing, or you, you're trying to like erase a whole bunch of grid items or something like that, then use hit test grid. It's the fastest thing that there is. That returns an index. It can also return a row and column if you want, but um, you can just get that from the index. So that gives us an index when we press down. And then when we're swiping, if we're allowed to continue on swiping, we calculate the column and the row based on the swipe index percent modulus, that is the calls, and then a math.floor of the swipe index divided by the calls. That's kind of standard stuff. That gives you a column and a row. If the data, so here's us getting our local data, if the data for our page at that column and row now, how can we call get data? Get data is over here in the data. Make new data. Get data. There it is. Get data. We stored it on the model. So that means the controller got past the model. This is a method stored on the model object that we made, um, which is this. Uh, we are in the controller now, but we're just saying get data. Hmm, let me just bookmark that. So I want to come back to it. I've hit a bookmark. I put that into an F1. I come up, oh, we're not down very far anyway. Uh, there is us uh, bringing in the model and look at what we did somewhere in here. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> where, where did we do that? Somewhere in here, I know we stored, uh, we, we did a shortcut to it. So uh, where the heck is that? It's gone. 
<laughs> okay, what was it that we were looking for? Um, get data. Copy. Let's check it out. Get data. Get data. There it is. It's right here. I don't know. Like, is that below where, where we're doing? Anyway, there it is. Get data is the models uh, get data. Get path data is the models get path data set. So we've just short formed that. Looks like we did it below where we were, and we get the F2 takes us back to our bookmark. All right, so we're getting data uh, for our page number and our column row, and if it's a space, then we uh, we don't have to move anything along. So in other words, if we're swiping on a space, then uh, <laughs> return. So that's the last of our checks. Now we know, hey, we're all in. We're going. We're, we're swiping on something. We're allowed to swipe on something. We're going. It's our turn. Yay! So um, we set allow check to false. This means that we, can, we, can, we can't swipe again. It doesn't tell anybody else whether we can swipe or not. But we say, hey, we also set full check to false. So each time we swipe, we're going to test to see if there's already a full uh, row. Now, I'm not going to actually go through all the logic there. That's very complicated logic. But we'll, we'll carry on until we hit that logic. So let's, let's see. So there's where we set the, the socket properties. We basically tell everybody else that we're busy. So it's busy check is now true. So everybody else is going to receive, or if they ask, hey, is it busy? They're going to be told, yes, true. So at some point, when we're no longer busy, when we finished moving, when the animation has done, we're going to have to set busy check here to false. And that tells everybody we're not busy anymore. So this is us trying to lock that movement. We also tell uh, like what data, so other we have to tell other people how we moved so that um, the other people can see that move. Okay, and we also set the time, the last check. I didn't show you last check. It's right up here. So uh, busy time, socket, dot, get latest value. Oh no, that was us testing. We must have set the last check at some point. Where was that? Do you see a last check anywhere? Uh, here. So it's in the socket request time. Every time we check, we request the time from the socket. We have to be careful here. Uh, everybody's clock could be different. They could be on different time zones, you know, who knows, or offset by something. So anytime you want a time in multi-user, you need to ask for the time from the socket. And that returns, uh, well, that's need, you need a, an event for that. So that's right. <laughs> what is the event called? It's somewhere nearby. Uh, okay, so that. Oh, sorry, right here. Um, there it is. Socket dot on time. So if we request a time, like here we are requesting a time right at the very beginning. We're also requesting a time here. But if we request a time, socket dot on time. When we receive an answer back, uh, we're setting last check to the e current time. So the data that comes back has a current time. That will give us the time on the server since the server was began. So Zim server on uh, the Amazon server. Uh, when we when we run the socket with forever, it's a Node.js thing. We're running it with this thing called forever. It should go forever. But when we ran that thing, this is the time that we ran it, or the time since the milliseconds since we we ran that basically. All right. So that's the last check time. Blah, bitty, blah, bitty, blah, bitty, blah. Where were we now? All right, we're sending that last check time to the server. And that way, if somebody else is checking and it's more than two seconds later, it's actually 200 milliseconds, but we're giving the benefit of the doubt sort of thing and saying, okay, you know, after two seconds, it's stale. It means, you know, like something went wrong. So for some reason, that didn't get cleared. But the next person that comes along that tries to set it, if they're able to set it, because it's stale, they'll overwrite it with the right number. Uh, so as far as I know, no big deal there. And then here uh, we push the pattern. So this tells us what we need to do to move. Now this is going to uh, animate stuff and do some complex things. It's going to set up these things called uh, blinds uh, that, that hides what's underneath. And then it's going to set up ghosts. The ghosts come up on top and the ghosts animate across the blinds. And when we're all done, uh, we're all done. So 
Anyway, uh, that's push pattern, which is probably down here somewhere. Now, when we receive data, this is the socket just receiving anybody's data. Well, if we receive data, we collect that data here. If data dot push data. So if in this data that we're receiving, there's a property called push data, that means somebody else is uh, pushing pattern data. It's, it's right here. So there's push data. That's, that's us sending the push data. So if the stuff that if we receive some data, as remember, this is the tricky thing about sockets. We're both the ones sending, but this code also has to handle receiving. So here is the code for receiving the data. And if that data has some push data, then we push pattern, same as this guy right here. We push pattern and we pass the data from that pattern. So push pattern expects a page number. Oh, and a page number. Here it is. Uh, this is the page that we're on. This is the start page, uh, which may not be the same thing. <laughs> That's what's confusing about it. Uh, might be, this is a start page. If we're the one pushing this, then that, these things are the same. So that's why these things happen to be the same here. But if we're the ones collecting it, uh, it may not be the same. Also, it, it sends it back to itself. Oh, gosh. You know, like, well, nothing like it. It's um, uh, To be able to push something from one page to another, the next page also needs to be pushed. And then maybe the next page after that is pushed. And you keep on going until you hit the start value again. So I think we talked a bit about that in, in the last Explorer, so I don't know if I want to go into it again, plus we're running quite low on time here. But it may be that the current page we're checking is not the start page, basically. So we had to collect both of those information. Uh, and we had to deal with it here. But basically, we're uh, the data is the call, the row, the, the swipe directions, and the swipe index. and you'll note that that's the same thing that we're passing into pushing a pattern. That's the information that we need. When we pass that to the rest of the world, the rest of the world then receives that information and it pushes its own patterns. Isn't that neat? So it's the same push pattern function, but sometimes it's somebody else using that push pattern and sometimes it's you yourself using push pattern. Uh, neat, huh? And now we've split up push pattern. Push pattern says, hey, if, if the if the push information's on the current page, then show it. But sometimes the push information is for a different page, and then you just update the data. No point in animating something there. You, nobody, that person can't see it. So it's split up in a couple different ways. It could be you pushing. It could be somebody else pushing. You could be on the page that you want to see it, or you might not be on the page that you want to see it. <laughs> so I was like, ay, ay, ay. Anyway, uh, there you go. So share tile. Hmm. Socket dot set property tile data. At some point, we might want to share all of our data, and I guess a couple different places needed to do that. So we made a little function that shares our tile data, and the master data is m dot data. So this is the the model is supposed to hold the master data. Now, another thing that happened in our data testing is somebody, and actually I did too on, on mine. I ended up missing a circle. So all of it was there except we were missing a circle. The other person was missing eight circles. So somewhere along the, the line, our data is getting out of sync and the number of spaces has changed. And that's obviously not good. So we're going to have to rethink this. It may be that we need to be more, uh, more strict on when the data gets shared. Right now we're saying, hey, tell everybody we're pushing something. So in somebody else's data, it just says we're pushing, and then that adjusts their data. Well, it's a little bit dangerous to adjust their data, but not necessarily adjust you know, my data or this data. <laughs> so somewhere along the line, those datas are, being, are, are out of sync. And I think we tried to sync up the data when you change pages, but for some reason that didn't work. You had to refresh the whole thing to sync the data. So, uh, you know, anyway, we're running into those issues, but uh, we'll probably get through that without too much difficulty. Here's all the push pattern. And I mean, it is possible. It's quite complex. It's quite custom. It is possible that 
it may interest you as to what's in here and that it would probably actually make a whole other explore but i think we're going to leave it <laughs> because as you can see it's like yikes now it's really just this watch ready here's where we go up this is what it looks like Okay, this is the, uh, sorry, I, I, I scrolled back up again there. Here's where it goes up. We find out if we're propagating. Uh, this one actually does the animation. So the animation is somewhere in here. Hopefully, <laughs> I think it's in there. There it is. Animating. Otherwise, if, if, it, if we're not on the current page, like if we're not on the same page as the data changing, then we just change the data. So that was it for up. But we did, it, it changes differently in how it propagates. So we did, uh, we didn't um, abstract it. We we made a different, like we, we spelled it out again for going left, for going up, for going down, and for going right. So that's why it looks like a lot of data. And when we're done, okay, and we are done, when we're done, look at what we do. We socket dot set properties, the tile data. So that should sync the tile data when we're done. Hmm. And a busy check false. We're no longer busy. So at this point, we should be syncing the tile data. So what must be missing is perhaps nowhere are we actually saying, oh, wait a minute, we got new tile data. Let's sync our tile data. I think that's what's missing. That would come in our data thing right here. So remember when we received data? <laughs> Do you love this? Oh, come on. I'm going to page up through all this stuff. Uh, when we receive data right here, yeah, we don't have it. All we received when we got data is, is um, did somebody just push data? Nowhere did we say, oh, if the data that comes in is new tile data, please sync your, sync your, your data. And if we did that, then maybe even some things would look like they're out of whack for a second, but they would still then sync and be the same. Uh, it might not solve the fact that we were losing some, some pieces or, or whatever there, but so be it. Hey, you know what? There we go. We just looked through the controller. So if we went back down through all of that, I think we were pretty close. Oh, this is going from page to page. Aside from doing the going to page to page <laughs> and manipulating the buttons. So there we are manipulating the buttons depending on which page. So to remove those little arrows or not. And <laughs> closing the menu and we've gotten a, a reward. There we are. We're done. Look, the end of the controller. Waha! Index model view controller. Wow. You know what, you guys, you did it. That that's um that's wonderful. This has been a Zim Explore. If you're still here, you gotta come and be with us. Zimjs.com slash slack. S-L-A-C-K. Alright, if you're still listening to this and you've gotten something out of it. Come on and talk to us. Come on. Come on. We'd love to see you there. Uh, let's build this thing. So we'll talk to you later. I am Dr. Abstract. Ciao. Have a good night or day. <laughs>